Welcome to today's webinar, Travel After COVID-19. I am your host, Janet Park Robbins. During the last couple of years, most of us have been missing the chance to experience and explore new places. So in this webinar, we'll talk to travel expert Rick Steves about what travel looks like moving forward and what older adults should know. All right, let's jump in and meet our speaker, Rick Steves. Hey, Janet, nice to be with you. Rick is a popular public television host a best-selling guidebook author, and an outspoken activist who encourages Americans to broaden their perspectives through travel. He's the founder and owner of Rick Steves Europe, a travel business with a tour program that brings more than 30,000 people to Europe every year. He lives and works in his hometown of Edmonds, Washington, where his office window overlooks his old junior high school. That's pretty cool. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here. My uh, my office and my uh, home uh, office looks over my junior high school. So I'm lucky I've had a, a little corner of the world I enjoy calling home, but it's a good springboard for exploring far away. And speaking of exploring, tell us a little bit about why is travel so important? Why don't we all just stay in our own little corner of the world? Well, I mean, it's like, imagine if you uh, were in a library and, and you were curious and you liked books and uh, you were there for years and then somebody said, hey, there's a whole section upstairs. I didn't know that. And a lot of people just keep going to the same place over and over. And I was lucky when I was a kid, my parents uh, had a reason to go to Europe. My dad was importing pianos. So we saw the piano factories in Germany and went up to Norway to visit the relatives. And as a teenager, I realized, wow, this world's a playground. And if you get your act together and uh, have some good information and plan carefully, you can explore it quite economically and quite smoothly. And I've been teaching that ever since. That's great. And I understand you have a clip you're going to play for us. Yeah, you know, I, I was I wanted to start off with a clip. We make TV shows for public television. And uh, at first it was just going to be, here's all the fun things you can do while you travel. But of course, we've got the world at an interesting time right now with this tragedy unfolding in Ukraine and with people's concerns about COVID and everything. Uh, it's I, I just feel really strongly that travel is fun and travel is also important. So I thought what we would run right now is the finale of a half hour show that I produced called Why We Travel. And it talks about how we connect. And I've spent 100 days a year, ever since I was a kid, connecting with people outside of our border. And I'm able to bring home what I think is the greatest souvenir. And that's a broader perspective, a greater appreciation of what we call home, but also a, a, a fun and engaging and, and, uh, and a positive uh, celebration sort of outlook at the rest of the world, the other 96% of humanity. So let's watch this last little three or four minute clip. By traveling thoughtfully, we connect. Even for those of us who can only travel as a state of mind, travel can result in a deeper connection. Travel connects us face to face with reality. It's not virtual. It's not through a viewfinder. Travel is candid honest being in the moment thank you in a world hungry for authenticity we yearn for connection and now she's quite big she's like you about like that yeah travelers connect with different cultures different people on the road strangers are just friends we've yet to meet travel frees us from routine it creates room for serendipity. Okay, so now I'm ready to be a shepherd. This is serendipity leads to connection. Travel forces us to bend and to flex. It makes us more tolerant and inspires us to celebrate diversity. The lessons I've gained from exploring Europe, the land of my heritage, are universal. For me, these lessons are affirmed and then stretched when traveling further afield. As a child ventures beyond his backyard, I ventured beyond Europe. Year after year, I pushed my boundaries. The world opened wide with a montage of wonders and lessons learned. Traveling beyond my comfort zone, culture shock became constructive the growing pains of a broadening perspective, my ethnocentrism challenged, the celebration of difference and oneness at the same time, the recognition that love is love in their home just as in mine. 
I think this is a beautiful, beautiful welcome here. Through travel, we see a world filled with joy, with compassion, and with good people. We learn the more we reach out, the more we receive. We learn that we all share the same world. Nice. And we all share the same window of time. Travelers seek bridges rather than walls. Every wall has two sides and two narratives. For one to be truly understood, both must be heard. Traveling, we realize the challenges of our future will be blind to borders and best overcome not by conflict and walls, but by community and bridges. There's so much fear these days. The flip side of fear, it's understanding. And we gain understanding when we travel. The celebration of Obama's... Travel is more than a holiday. It gives us new experiences, acts as our greatest teacher, makes our lives more meaningful, and connects us with a global family. We can't all travel physically, but anyone can live with a traveler's mindset. It's a choice. Travel makes us more comfortable with the world, our hearts bigger, and our lives richer. And it makes us happier. And that is why we travel. That's great. I loved your point on freedom from routine. Boy, do we need that now more than ever. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, it's just so exciting to be able to get out of your norm and recognize that there's so many different ways to embrace life on this planet. It just adds more colors to the palette, you know? It's just, it's really fun. Yeah. How, how did you first like catch the travel bug? Uh, I was, uh, my parents dragged me to Europe when I was 14 years old. Uh, my dad was importing pianos, as I mentioned, and we went up to see the relatives in Norway. And I saw kids a couple years older than me with rucksacks and year rail passes and no parents. <laughs> uh, I looked at my mom and dad, I thought, I don't need you guys for this. Europe can be my playground. And I've been going back ever since. I just, for me, it's a fountain of youth. When I go to Europe, I, I just, it's, it's so physical. It's so stimulating. It's so um, learning. It's so new. I meet so many people. Um, I, I just, it invigorates me. And I, I mean, I think that's for me, I'm going to Europe next, uh, next week for six weeks. And uh, I'm just so excited. I can just hardly wait to get over there. That's great. So now I know you have um, you have a presentation to share with us. Yeah, I've got just a few we'll slides up. and yeah. I'd love to show you these slides. And then uh, Janet will have a talk about, uh, you know, some timely what ifs, what's up to date about travel and everything. But let me just take you on a quick slideshow. And I'm just going to blitz through these because we I want to get into the Q&A as soon as possible. But uh, ever since I have a kid, I've, I've, I was a kid, I've been traveling. I just got back from a, a, a wonderful hike around Mount Blanc just a couple of months ago. And um, what I do for my living is I take groups around Europe. As you mentioned, we take 30,000 people around Europe on a normal year. Of course, we've been shut down for a couple of years, but our tour program just started up again uh, last month. And I'm very excited about that. I'm going over with my crew here next week and we're always filming new shows for public television. And uh, the main thing I do, I spend hundred days a year in Europe is uh, update my guidebooks. So I'm gonna be really busy in the next month making sure my guidebooks are right up to date after any changes from COVID. Let me just take a couple of minutes and uh, hike with you around Mount Blanc. This was the greatest vacation I've had in ages. And uh, we just, I just had to get out. This is last September. And uh, three friends and I took off. It's uh, Mount Blanc is a hundred mile hike and uh, we just cherry picked it. We did it the lazy way. We did the best 60 miles in six days. We slept in nice hotels. We had a service that took our bags to the next hotel. So we just walked each day and uh, you can stay in hotels or you can stay in mountain huts. But each day started out with a pretty good climb. We went from 5,000 feet to a mountain pass at about 8,000 feet. So a 3,000 foot climb. We'd have our picnic on the, on the, on the pass and then we would just enjoy the community. Half the people up there were Americans, it seemed like. Uh, there was no sense of COVID at all. COVID just didn't exist in the mountains. And uh, I just had so much fun talking to other travelers. And it was really encouraging for me because I'm, when I'm 66 years old now, I was not the, the old kid on the block. There were a lot of people enjoying it that were well beyond me in their retirement years. 
We had a blast. I wish I had three hours to talk about all these points, trip planning, packing, safety, communicating, transportation, eating, sleeping, and avoiding crowds. All very important. I'm just going to blitz through a bunch of pictures here because I just want to take a few minutes. But I will remind you, I've got 30 hours of lectures on my website. It's all free. And it talks about these topics. And you can go to the University of Travel at ricksteves.com and learn about this stuff. But fundamentally, You've got to have an attitude that you want to get out of your comfort zone, meet new people, eat new things. If you haven't eaten snails yet, you got to go to France and check it out. You want to get off the beaten path. You want to climb up that donkey path in a town that has no promotional budgets. You want to find a little town that's lost on the Riviera, not a famous resort. You don't want to know the name of the town. You want to find a little place where you're just part of the party. Uh, a key for me is to go to the famous places, but do it when the people are not there. If you're in Athens during cruise ship time, when all the people on the cruise ships are on shore, it's going to be crowded. If you happen to be there without the cruise ships um, on your own, well, be sure you are at the Acropolis before or after the groups hit. Understand the history of what you're looking at and get away from the famous sites. Uh, Salzburg is a wonderful town to check out, but just a couple hours south, you got your own private little, little village nestled onto a ledge, bullied between a mountain and a lake. What a beautiful place to discover. Get up early in the morning, stay out late at night in Venice, and that town really is all yours. Hike to ruined castles. Hike to medieval wonders. Here in Germany, don't go to the Rhine River, go to the Mosul River. Uh, understand what you're looking at. I, for years, I thought this was a medieval castle because it's pointy. It's not. It's, Roman, it's, it's romantic. It was built as the same generation as the Eiffel Tower. This is full of rebar and poured concrete, but it was done in an over-the-top medieval style, and that was the ism of the late 1800s, romanticism. When you look at these great sites, understand what you're looking at. This is not just an aqueduct. This is the most scenic bridge in a 30-mile-long aqueduct built by Romans 2,000 years ago to bring water into the city of Nîmes, engineered so the water loses one inch every 100 yards for 30 miles. Now, when you kayak underneath that Roman site, you understand, wow, Roman infrastructure. The museums are great, but remember, they can be exhausting. You want to be selective. That's one thing I do is I kind of sort through all the superlatives and, and curate it, understanding what is your attention span. That's our job as tour guides and as guidebook writers, but know what you're looking at. Art is a time tunnel experience. I'm so excited about that. We're producing a a six hour mini series about European art from prehistoric uh, until the present. And it'll air all over the country on public television this fall. Take time to sit and have a drink during cocktail hour on the most expensive square in the town and watch the fashion show parade by. That's the passeggiata. You can be in the parade or you can be sitting in the bar, sipping your drink and having your munchies and watching the show. But one way or another, you gotta make the scene. Be a cultural chameleon. I don't think that much about chocolate when I'm in this hemisphere, but when I'm in Belgium, chocolate is really exciting. And I'll go to the best little chocolateria and I'll buy it from a woman whose family's been making it for generations and I'll learn about it and I'll have the very best. You need to be that, you know, it's, it's drink what the locals are drinking, eat what the locals are drinking. This is a spritz. That's what all the kids are drinking on the squares in the university towns of Italy. Buy them a couple of drinks and you're the most popular kid on the block. You got to decide, are you going to take a tour or are you going to go on your own? There's good reasons to do both, but you really want to make a knowledgeable decision. There's ways to get information without hiring a tour. Now, when I'm in a lot of towns, I like to take the guided walking tour that the tourist board puts on. Here in Bath in, in England, two hours west of London, it's absolutely free. I like to hire private guides. As I said, I'm going to Europe next week. I'll be in Europe for uh, 40 days. For 10 days, I'll be filming, and for 30 days, I'll be on my own researching. But every day when I'm researching, I'll have my own private guide, one at 10 and one at six, every day. Hire these guides. They've got cars. They speak English. They're historians. They can be your best friend. Um, I'm just so excited that finally we're able to do our tours again after two years of being locked down. So that's something that we're very excited about. And we've had 10 tours go in the last couple of weeks, and they've just been great. Um, we find that, you know, it's a long story, but, but uh, Europe is ready for travel uh, sort of post COVID now. You know, these are the kind of people that would take our tours. And this is, I'm so thankful to have a staff that helps us put all this together. It's been a tough time for tourism, you know, for the last couple of years. So we're all like uh, a little caged birds and we're ready to get out there and travel again. 
packing light. You don't have a burrow to carry your gear. You've got to get serious about packing light. And you want to be in shape before your trip the best you can. It's hot and it's crowded. The most grueling thing about traveling for older travelers is the heat and the crowds of summer. I make a point to travel in the shoulder season and bundle up. It makes so much sense. You're going to do a lot of walking with your gear. So you want to be mobile. You want those wheelie bags or pack light enough to hang it on your back with a, a, pad, a carry on the airplane size suitcase. You don't need this much gear. We take 30,000 people on our tours every year, and most of them are, uh, well, a lot of them are retired. And for a lot of people, what? One carry on the airplane size bag is all we get? Yes, that's all you get. That's all you need. Two weeks, two months, young, old, north, south, uh, summer, winter, uh, you get one carry on the airplane size bag. That's my bag. That's my little day bag. And that's what I live out of. I'm heading off for 40 days. Oh my gosh. I, I don't know how you do it. Well, it's uh, I've got a whole one hour lecture on how to do it, but you're on vacation. And uh, this is a great way to get people real about that. So I would give yourself this self-imposed limit, nine by 22 by 14 inches. We design bags like that. Um, there's a lot of bags like that. This is our group right here. And this is the way we travel. And for a lot of people, that's a little bit aggressive to start with, but I've never had a traveler that was upset with me for making them pack light. They're thankful. I check in with them a week into the trip. Thank you, we're never gonna pack heavy again. So again, um, we've got lots of information about packing light in my material. Hey, I was just in Europe um, yeah, with my partner and we had a great time. And I just wanna talk for just a minute, Janet, about COVID because um, uh, all the museums are open. Uh, we had a wonderful time, but when you're indoors for now, you do need to wear a mask when you're in public places. Uh, you need to have your CDC card. I just checked with my staff. I'm flying off in a couple of days. I do not need a test to get out of the United States. I do need a CDC card and I will need a passenger locator for them filmed out, filled out before I get on the airplane. It's very straightforward. And when you fly home, there's a good chance you'll need a negative test and don't worry about it until it's time to fly home. And then ask at your hotel, hey, where do I get my test? And invariably there's a pharmacy, a little pop-up pharmacy around the corner and it's a cottage industry for 20 bucks. They'll stick something up your nose and 10 minutes later, you're walking out of there with your negative test, God willing, and you're good at the airport the next day. So um, you could get all the experts in the world together right now to talk about what it's like to travel during COVID. But if your trip is in two months, all that information does not matter. You just gotta be flexible. You gotta realize there's a few hoops. It's essentially required that you are fully vaccinated. We're taking, we've got 20,000 people signed up on our tours for this year. Everybody who gets on a Rick Steves bus is gonna be fully vaccinated and boosted. All the guides, all the drivers, all the participants. I don't wanna be mean about it, but I don't wanna take your money if you're not gonna take a shot because you won't be able to, you'll be waiting outside in the street while we're having fun inside in Europe. Uh, it's just a very small world when it comes to travel if you're not fully vaccinated. Europe is traveling. Here on this train, it says a ticket, a mask and a COVID certificate and you are good to go. Uh, coming into the Louvre Museum, just a couple months ago, I spent a, year, a month in Europe a couple months ago. My staff is traveling a lot now. Um, you, you show your CDC card and you're into the museum. Uh, at breakfast, you, every hotel's a little different, but you may wear a plastic mitt when you wanna go to refill your breakfast plate. Um, there's just, you know, it's just common sense when it comes to not kissing the foot of St. Peter's uh, when you're in St. Peter's Basilica. Certain things you just can't do anymore because of COVID, but the essence of Europe is alive and well. So uh, Europe's infrastructure is amazing. They're investing in their roads and their bridges and their tunnels. It makes it more important than ever that we get off the beaten path. I would remind you when you're traveling that uh, the trains are amazing. Bullet trains lacing Europe together. Uh, 200 mile an hour trains are just routine. Um, one thing that I, I really want to stress is Cruise ships are great for older travelers. I love going on cruise ships because I've got my, my totally modern, easy access, American floating resort. And then every day I've got a different city to explore. So it's not you know rugged travel. It's not a, a lot of my um, market is not interested in that kind of travel, but I think cruising is economic, it's efficient, and it is certainly good if you're several generations traveling together. 
and some people are uh, aggressive and some people don't want to do that much uh, hiking and so on. There's a bus waiting for you at each port to take you on an easy access tour, or you can go have an adventure. So cruising does make a lot of sense for a lot of people. As I mentioned, Europe is crowded. It's going to be crowded this summer. There's a big backlog of people that want to get out there and travel. And uh, it's important to avoid those crowds the best you can. Uh, that's pretty common sense how to do that. And Europe is also hot. I don't know my um, Celsius uh, thermometer very well, but I do know that 28 in Celsius is 82 in Fahrenheit, 2882. It's a good little trick. Uh, for me, hey, I mean, that is a good trick. I'll remember that now. For me, I'm a Seattleite and I, I don't do well in the heat. Anything over 28 is really hot. Uh, this is France and everything's in the 30s. That's going to be Ooh, 35 is 95. I just that, looked it up. Oh, is that right? Okay, that's good. Um, so you got crowds, you know, but there's two ways to get into the Eiffel Tower. You can wait in that line or you can get a reservation and then you will go straight to the front of the line. Uh, just get your reservations. It's pretty simple. You want to go to the famous castle, get a reservation. And remember, 90% of Europe has no tourist crowds at all. And you just got to get to the places that have no tour budget, our promotional budgets. And then you need to be an extrovert. You need to get out there and meet the people. If you see four cute, cute guys sitting on a bench, ask them to scoot over. They're just hanging out. You want to enliven their day. I love to hang out with the old guys on the bench there and uh, just watch the world go by. So, uh, you know, Europe is uh, waiting for us. Uh, it's very important to equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart. Here's a couple of cruisers with um, the chapter that I have for Naples ripped out and they're having a day on their own, even though they're taking a cruise ship. There's not a, not a hint of cruise ship for 10 hours as they explore Naples and they've got good information. Again, those guidebooks empower you. This mother has a guidebook and her and her kids are having a wonderful vacation. So that's what we're all about at Rick Steves Europe. I love the fact that, um, you know, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And uh, age only matters if you're a cheese when you're overseas. So I just love not. <laughs> my, I just wait, love wait, wait. What is this a picture of you doing? I'm going down a mountain in a mountain luge. It's a go kart where you. It's a way to get more mileage out of your ski lifts in the summer. You ride the lift up, you sit on this cart, and then you go zipping down the mountain. We do it with our tour groups, and some people go slow like tortoises, which is fine, and other people go ripping down the mountain, but it is a lot of fun. You look like you're going ripping on that photo. <laughs> oh, there's a good guy. There's he, He's going. He's having a good time. So uh, again, travel is kind of a fountain of youth. Europe is uh, ready with its culture. It's ready with its artisans that would love to show off for you, and it's, of course, a chance where you can learn or enjoy living really well with the cuisine and the wine. I love the fact that the traditions are alive and vivid today, just like before. But the key is we want to find those offbeat nooks and backdoor crannies. Imagine staying in this little town and taking a hike during the day. This is what I'm all about, is empowering people to enjoy travel and to enjoy travel smartly, safely, and experientially. Uh, so there's a, just a, a quick look, uh, Janet, about my style of travel. And um, I would just love to uh, entertain some questions or uh, talk that's to you a little bit. That's great. I, got, I have a couple up front and then we got some coming in. Uh, and yes, as one of the many people who've used one of your guidebooks to see Europe, um, they, they are great. Uh, and we know that Europe's your passion. So are there any, I, I know you say get off the beaten path, but are there any must-see spots right now in Europe that you're like, this is a must-see? Uh, no, not at all. Everything is, it's just up to you. A lot of, when I get interviewed for newspapers and magazines, you know, what's the, what's the timely hook? What's the hot destination? I don't want to go to the hot destination. That's where all the crowds are. That's where the prices are up. My, I want to go where my travel dreams are taking me. You know, we went with our kids to uh, Ireland because, uh, you know, their, their mom's Irish and uh, it was a great opportunity for the kids to connect with their heritage. Um, I, I, I was in the mood to go hiking around a mountain. So I hiked around Mount Blanc. If you're in the mood to take a cruise, if you're in the mood to, to uh, ride a camel, if you're in the mood to uh, go on a sauna with a bunch of fins, if, if you're in the mood to uh, go to a pub and, and learn about whiskey in Scotland, wherever your travel dreams are taking you, that's what's hot. You know, when we travel, you mentioned cruises. I'm a, I'm a huge lover of cruises. And you mentioned them being great for multiple generations, right? Adult kids, grandkids. Are there any other traveling tips that you have 
right? Some of our viewers might be grandchildren traveling with their children and their grandchildren, right? Their grandparents traveling with their children. Grandchildren. Any other tips for multi-generational travel? Well, I've found, and I've given this a lot of thought, I just love it when people on our take on our tours, we have a lot of cases where grandparents have a, have a tradition of taking their grandkids one at a time on a tour. It's a great way for the grandparent and the, and the grandchild to bond. Um, and any and when people are going on their own, um, I think that it's very important from a, the kid's point of view is not to feel like you are uh, imprisoned on this old person's uh, view of Europe. You know, you got to honestly give the kids uh, input into the itinerary. You got to do things the kids want to do. You also got to give the kids uh, a rein to do their own thing and then come back together again. I just love that idea of three generations traveling together. And uh, everybody does their own thing, but everybody has a base where they come together. As you can imagine, that's one great thing about a cruise ship. And that's one great thing about a tour that gives you some free time. Uh, with our tours, we have a thing called orient and disperse. We wanna do what you should do all together, but we don't wanna keep people all together all the time. When you've, got your, when you've seen the most important sites, when you're oriented and you feel comfortable, then you got a little free time so people can do their own thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, your, your ticket to freedom really is information. You need to have that information. So, you know, the museum's open tonight. It's actually open until nine o'clock on Tuesdays. You can go there after dinner. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've got an Uber or you've got a trolley or you've got a subway. There's so many practical bits of information. And that's kind of what I'm all about is reminding people, if you stand in a long line at St. Mark's Basilica in Venice with your bag and you get to the front, they will not let you in. You just wasted an hour. But if you park your bag over there, 50 yards away, there's a depot for the bags. They'll give you a token, which is the, the claim check for your bag. You can take that token to the front of the line and save a whole hour and go directly in to St. Mark's. When somebody gets a tip like that, they really that's like a great those are the tips that's the know before you go stuff yeah. yeah and that's a single tip that justifies the purchase of a guidebook and that's yeah. why i'm a big fan of guidebooks not just the guidebooks i've totally. read anytime i travel i use that guidebook and then i expect myself to travel smart because janet um people are oftentimes looking at saving money but another uh limited resource that's every bit as precious and and valuable is your time you want to yeah. save time and uh, people save money a lot but a lot of times they waste time there are certain cases when you want to spend a little money to save time you know I'll, many times i'll take a i'll take a long taxi ride from hotel to hotel i'll take a taxi ride from my hotel in madrid to my hotel in in uh, toledo that's a one hour drive and it could cost a hundred dollars seems like a lot of money but if there's two people and if you're going from your hotel to the train station train station to the train station train station to the hotel for yeah. two people, you're going to spend 60 or $80 anyways on tickets. Why not just have the taxi pick you up at your hotel and drop you at your hotel for $20 more? Uh, that's kind of thinking out of the box from a use your time smartly. And especially if you are interested in just making travel easier. I mean, for me, the most grueling thing about travel, as I mentioned, is the heat and the crowds of summer. If you want to make it easy, be mindful of ways to take this, the sweat out of it and then avoid the crowds and uh, avoid the heat of the summer. It's hot over there. I mean, I don't know how people live in, in the hot parts of our country, um, but it is really hot in Europe and they don't have air conditioning like where you... <laughs> you oh. learn that the hard way. I learned that when I went to Spain in August with a friend. Yeah, well, they didn't, I mean, they didn't need air conditioning up until this generation. So it's just, and they just feel like it's kind of a defeat to have to get air conditioning. Uh, we just say, well, air condition the world, you know, we, we're getting yeah. hotter and hotter. But uh, in Europe, they, uh, your energy is expensive and uh, it's getting hotter. So you'll want to remember that. And, uh, you know, traveling the summer is, uh, in fact, in the, I travel every year. I travel April and May. I go home in June and then July and August. Usually I'm four months in Europe. Always April and May is the Mediterranean and always July and August is north of the Alps. I prefer hot, long days, crowds north of the Alps because I want it to be lively. I want good weather. I want it to pop. Um, and there really aren't serious crowd problems north of the Alps. The serious crowd problems 
are generally the places south of the Alps. And that's where the serious heat concerns also. Right. I, I love your thought too on there's the cost of money and the cost of time. When we're on vacation, we have a limited time. We have a very limited budget. We don't get to go for months like you, right? So you're right. Taking a taxi may be the smartest thing to do. I love that tip. That's great. So we try to save money, but you're right. How much another, time are you? Doing? Another luxury, Janet, is to hire a local guide. I love to have a local guide. When people look at my TV shows, you know, I'm always introducing my friend and fellow tour guide. It seems like I got friends everywhere in Europe. I'm just paying them to be my friends. <laughs> You can pay them to your friend too. You know, they're just they're they're independent guides. They've got a schedule. They got to fill it up so they can pay their bills. And they would love to meet you at your hotel for three or four hours for a reasonable price. And then you have an English speaking person who knows who's going to tailor the experience to what you're interested in. And if you can afford that, and if you can split it with three or four people, especially, it's a really nice idea. I love that. That's such a great way to do that. Get off the beaten path, right? Talk to a local. It's yeah, right. So we're talking a lot about COVID these days, right? And you said, you know, you, you talked a little bit about traveling COVID. Was there anything that surprised you and was it easier or harder than you expected? You know, um, I hesitate to promote traveling during COVID because it's a personal issue. Yeah. I would say if you're, some people have to be really careful. Some people just are very risk averse. Other people are saying, hell's bells, I'm gonna get over there and have a good time, you know? Um, that's totally right. There's just different ways to do it. Um, I would just say, if you would be comfortable right now taking a trip in the United States, you know, um, my partner and I went to Cape Cod in Boston just for a little four day weekend, and it was a great time. If you're comfortable doing that, you should be comfortable flying to Europe and having a good time in Europe. Europe, if anything, I think is safer from a COVID point of view than the United States, in part because Europeans are more community oriented. They, they, they're not as skeptical as we are in a lot of cases about the system. Uh, they know they've got to embrace science. They've got to live together. They've got to take care of their neighbors. And people understand you wear a mask. It's just kind of common. It's, not, it's more than common sense. It's common decency to wear a mask. Uh, regardless of what I might think, somebody else is more comfortable if I wear a mask. I will do that because I'm a nice guy. Uh, you know. And in Europe, there's a lot of nice people that are neighborly. Part of the part of the situation is they've got um, they don't have the population sparsity that we've got. They've got population density. They've got a lot of diversity and they're living in the same spot for a long time. So they take care of each other. And I felt really good about it. I just felt um, comfortable in Europe. There are three issues. There are, you know, there's the CDC card. Don't worry about some European QR code. All you need is your American CDC card. It's got to be fully boosted. And then you've got this test. Occasionally, you're going to have to need a negative test to do something. Um, I just put some quick test things in my box. I'm just packing up today to go on my trip. I thought I'll bring a few tests along. But I, when I need a serious uh, test, I just go to the local pharmacy in Europe. And uh, you don't need an appointment. You just go around the corner. And who knows about that? The person behind the desk at the hotel. That's what they do. They answer questions all day long. If there's an airport nearby, people, Americans are saying, I'm flying tomorrow. Do I need a test? And they will know the answer and then they'll know where to get your test. So they're the expert. They know what's happening. Don't solve that problem a month in advance because it can change. You need to solve it again, even if you do solve it now. So you might as well just solve it once. Worry about it a couple of days before you fly home. And then the hidden little funny thing is this passenger locator form. And I'll tell you, you can miss your airplane if you don't have your passenger locator form filled out. You got to go to the website of your airline and you got to fill it out. Now, I don't like to do that fumbling around on my phone while I'm checking in at the airport. I'm, I get all stressed out about that. Do it in your hotel the day before, and then you know you're all set and they know that you're coming and you don't get blindsided by that when you get to the airport the next day. Sometimes they require it, sometimes they don't. I'm flying British Air from uh, United States to London next week. And we do have a passenger locator form that we have to fill out. They're gonna send me an email. I shall fill it out on my laptop. It'll be no stress. And then I'll be going on my way. So, um, you know, you, you keep your distance, you wear a mask, you get vaccinated. And then you find that the, the, the most important thing, Janet, is the energy of Europe is there. The magic of Europe is there. The gelato, the wine, the paseo, the, fist, the, the markets, it's all there. The little mom and pops are still open. 
I was very worried because the things that make my guidebooks are Rick Steves guidebook, and I've got 50 of them that I work on with my staff of 100, is the little mom and pop adventures, the creative passions that the, the dreams that people have as entrepreneurs, uh, mm -hmm. little restaurants, little cafes, little guest houses, little bed and breakfasts. I love that. My mission is to connect people with people. My mission is to equip and inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. And uh, when you go to Europe, you want to connect with these little business people. I was really nervous that the little businesses would not survive two years of COVID. I thought right. it would be a, a continent of Starbucks and Subway sandwiches and uh, Amazon delivery trucks, you know. Uh, big corporations can survive this pandemic and even thrive during this tough time. What I've learned from my uh, experiences, and I've got some of my colleagues over in Europe right now researching our books and updating them, Almost everybody has survived in Europe. They've had government funding, they've That's had local great. patronage, and now they are ready for the uh, international tourism to kick back in. So uh, the Europe awesome. that we know and love is still there. That's great. You know, we're going to get some questions in a second. I want to pop up the slide on how to learn more about Rick, follow him on social media. Rick's talked a lot about getting good information before you travel. So we'll pop that slide up. You can follow him there. Um, there we go. Oh. You Thank can learn you. more at his website. Yeah, I, I would say the most, of course, I've got about a million people on Facebook and I'll be posting every day almost while I'm in Europe. And that's a fun way to, for me to be in touch with people, just simply Rick Steves on Facebook. But the most important thing is if you're curious about uh, the information that we have, or if you're cu curious about the tours that we lead around Europe, just go to ricksteves.com. Uh, you know, I want to remind you, all the TV shows we've ever produced, we've produced 150 TV shows. They're all right there just to click away. They're free. There's there's no ads. It's just we love to share our information about travel. And it's all right there at ricksteves.com. That's fantastic. Um, we've seen so many of those, seen so many of those as well. So follow there. Um, OK, so now it's time to hear from all of you. I'm going to start with this one. That's I got to know this one. What's a must tip for packing light? Like there've got to be a couple of secrets to like, how do you get by on just that little amount of stuff? Yeah, well, don't, do not pack for the worst scenario. Pack for the best scenario and buy stuff as you go if you need it. Uh, that's a lot of people, they have to have a backup of this and they really want that just in case. You got to carry your gear. It's, it's, it, there's a real consequence when you take extra stuff. So um, I would say get a reality check with how mobile are you. You want to be mobile. And again, um, it's not heroism. It's just an enlightened approach to traveling. You're on vacation. You don't need a lot of stuff. Um, layer it for warmth. You know, you go casual, uh, have a good, well-worn or not well-worn, but well-broken in pair of walking shoes. That's really important. And uh, remember, you're not going hiking in the mountains. You can buy stuff uh, on the road if you need it. So uh, just be mobile. That's great. Uh, another question coming in. Do you have to have the COVID card or can you use the QR code on an app or do you have to have your card? I don't know. Uh, I, I just, as far as I know, I just use my COVID card and I flash it everywhere I go. Um, if you have a, if you have one on your phone, it should work the same, but um, I don't know exactly the answer to that question. I've just kept it really simple with my COVID card. I photograph it and that can be handy. Yeah, well, that's the key. Like, I have a photo of it on my card. I downloaded an app where you could scan it and see a photo too, and I have the original. So, um, it's yeah. just you're dealing in a foreign country. It's nice to have if you've got that QR code. That's great. Just that physical, the CDC card, yeah, the actual they, card, and they look at it. I mean, mine happens to be you got one shot on one side and another shot on the other side. I thought they would just take a glance and go, yeah, but they look at it and they go, "There's only one shot here." And I go, well, turn it over. Oh, there's the other one. Good. Okay, you can enter. So there, I take that quite seriously. Um, it's just when you go inside in public places, a museum, uh, a mall, uh, you know, uh, your your breakfast room, a, a hotel, uh, a, um, a restaurant. I I was fascinated just a couple of months ago in Florence. I was just having my lunch in a very nice restaurant in Florence, and I was just watching how politely they checked everybody's, uh, you know. A certificate that they had a local, they had, they had their shots and then they were welcome to come in. I'm glad because I want to relax. I don't want to be anxiety stricken. I don't want to go to a biker bar surrounded by a bunch of people that don't believe in shots. You know, I, I want to go to a place where people embrace science and they're, they're not going to be um, endangering me. Uh, it's just my personal feelings, you know, and um, when you travel in Europe, you want to have a, re you want to eat in a restaurant where you're surrounded by people who are vaccinated 
and you will be because you can't get into a restaurant in these countries for now. That's going to change. We're in a, I mean, that's why I say it doesn't matter what the situation is now if you're traveling in three yeah. months. So you just got to kind of know what's happening today as you travel. But I, I know a lot of people worry about airplanes. I'm no scientist, but I feel very comfortable in airplanes. Uh, they've got it figured out. Um, I don't think people get, we would know it if people got yeah. like, the COVID from, from a flight. Yeah. Uh, I think where you're endangered is where you hang out in an enclosed space without ventilation with, with the people who you don't know. All right, here's another great question coming in. So the Euro has simplified travel and not having to have all the foreign currencies, but do you have any tips for non-EU countries Right. How do you keep from ending up with all the coins and bills you may never use again? Well, that's a very important thing because let's say you're going into Switzerland and they have the Swiss franc and you're, you change $500 and you got $500 in Swiss francs and you spend three, $200 and then you leave the country with $300. You spend, you have to change back that $300 into euros again or into dollars. You have changed 500 plus 300. You've changed $800 worth of francs to spend 200. Uh, you know, if you change $200 to spend $200, that's going to cost you 3% or something. Right. But if you change $800 to spend $200, that's going to cost you 15% just because you're changing so much to spend so little and every dollar you change, you lose. Point is you want to change accurately. And then after that, Europe is becoming very reliant on credit cards. So I would, I would um, underestimate how much cash you need. And then as you're running out your bank, uh, you know, before you leave a country, you run out of cash, the rest of it, you just spend with your credit card. Um, rely on your credit card to minimize the extra. But um, yeah, the more you change uh, and you want to change, uh, you, you change at exchange desks and nobody changes out of the good of their heart. They, they, they may say no commissions, but they just have higher rates. <laughs> right. Or they may say it's, great, paid. it's got higher commission. So there's commissions and there's rates and you should know what you're, you're spending. But I'm so thankful for having the Euro because you know uh, all of Europe has, uh, has the same coins jangling in their pockets. And uh, those, those coins can be big. There's coins worth $2. Uh, you yeah. have one of those, you just, uh, you just waste it. It's a heavy it. pocket. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know I use credit cards a lot and less, but when you're going to mom and pop sometimes, right? Yeah. You know. I like to have cash in Europe. It varies from country to country, but I generally use cash and I just change cash uh, when I, uh, I just, as soon as I arrive in Europe, I just get a bunch of euros and then I'm on my way. Okay. This person is asking, what are the best walking shoes? I've tried so many and they never work. They never last the trip. Well, I'm no uh, uh, fashion dish when it comes to shoes or anything, but I like Echoes, ECCO. They're great shoes. Uh, uh, and I just use my echoes. I don't want to, I've got hiking boots for hiking in the Alps, but uh, when I'm traveling, I don't want to be wearing my mountain shoes. I want something that looks urban, but something that is solid and comfortable. And my, my echoes are really good. I still want to know how you're carrying hiking boots in that little bag along with everything uh, else. I just, carry, I just carry one pair of shoes. If I'm going hiking in the Alps, that's different. I, I packed uh, differently when I was hiking, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to be heading off next week for 40 days and 40 nights. And, uh, you know, it's, it seems barbaric. I've just got one pair of shoes, but uh, it works for me. And uh, it's just, you know, uh, if you need a second pair of shoes, uh, make it a, a very light pair of second shoes, but just ask yourself, do I really need this? Do I really need three pairs of pants? Uh, maybe, oh, yeah. maybe I don't, but I don't. I and I don't You're so it. right that we, we overestimate. We, I overpack. My husband yells at me every time. You don't need them. I know, I know. You pick up each item and you look at it critically. Do I need oh, the bins enough to justify carrying it all around Europe? I mean, it'll be great on the beach, but do I really? That's my point. I'd rather buy it on the beach and give it away than carry it through Europe for my whole yeah. trip. For people who are not spontaneous, how do you suggest they get off the beaten path? Well, I'm not saying be totally spontaneous. I've got my whole schedule figured out already. I know every day where I'm sleeping, and I've got my guide set up and I've got my reservations for the important sites. Because if you're gonna see Leonardo's Last Supper, you need a reservation. If you're gonna go into the Uffizi Gallery, you want a reservation. It's not required, but you'll have to wait in a long, long line or you can step right in. If you're gonna go up the Eiffel Tower, get a reservation. Yeah. So you wanna get those basic things to pin things down. And then after that, you're flexible. You know, you're feeling there's, you know, you just want to get out and take a walk before breakfast. You can do that. You want to sleep in, you can do that. 
uh, but you know, you've got your basics figured out. I've got my, you know, I've, I've, I've purchased my train tickets already for my trip. I know every connection, I know every hotel, and I got my flights. After that, I like to be flexible within the confines, within the parameters that I've already set and reserved in advance. You, your point about asking at the hotel or the inn where you're staying is a good one too. We've, you know, my friends and I have always gotten really great suggestions. They live there. So yeah. you get great suggestions from the people there too sometimes on. But you want to you want to always say, where would you go? Not where should I go? Because they think you want to go to some right. <laughs> kitschy little, you know, thing for the tourists. Uh, and a lot of tourists want that. But if you want just the local hole in the wall that is really good value surrounded by local people instead of other tourists, yeah, uh, we ask for that. I mean, what I like to do, Janet, is to remember when I'm looking for a restaurant, and this every night for the next month, I'm going to be looking at restaurants for my guidebook research. Yeah, I'm finding good restaurants. And what I want to find is not a place on a famous square that has a big English sign that says we uh, we speak English and accept credit cards and a pre-printed printed language uh, menu in five languages. Yeah. A little hole in the wall, low rent place on the next street over filled not with tourists, but with locals. Uh, hole in the wall means it's low rent, so they don't have to charge you more for your food. I want to find a place that has a small handwritten menu in one language. Small because they're cooking up what they can uh, efficiently cook up and sell yeah. profitably at a good price. One language because they're targeting locals, not tourists. And handwritten because it flexes according to what's uh, fresh in the market this way. Right. And what's I love fresh? That. What do we I buy love, today? I love the idea that a good eater can go to a good restaurant, look at the menu and know where they are and what month it is by what's being served. You want to eat with the season and you want to eat what's local. In Europe, they've got this thing called a zero kilometer meal. A zero kilometer meal, meaning everything is 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 produced right there in the village. I, I really like that. That's great. I love that. All right, here's another question. Any tips or tricks on how or when to purchase affordable airfare? I don't know. I just rely on my travel agent. I've got a travel agent. I, I, I mean, for domestic flights, you can just book your own. But for international flights, I just like to have an expert. Uh, and I'm happy to pay the commission to them or the fee or whatever. Um, but I, I get my flights uh, usually three months in advance. You know, But I, I don't really know what the answer to that question is. That's a right. We all feel like we play the game. You see an article and then you try to play the game and then two weeks later it goes down and you get mad at yourself. So it's, you know, there's no games. They just, the more you wiggle, the more you lose. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, that's right. If you want to go, go. I think it's that time and money thing too. Like how much time do you want to yeah. spend? That's why I've got a travel agent. I say, I want to go here and it's complicated. I've, I, it's been years since I flew in out of the same city. I do not fly in out of the same city. You go open yeah. jobs into one city, out of another city. You don't want to have to return to where you started. That makes no sense at all in most cases. Um, and then if something goes wrong, I mean, things, especially nowadays, uh, you know, things change because of COVID. Um, you've got to be flexible and you've got to have a, an expert that that knows what's happening and, and will speak up for you. And that's right. part of the benef benefit to me of having a travel agent. Right. All right, here's a question about tipping. Do you find that tipping customs in Europe are changing? These people say last time they went a couple of years ago, it kind of seemed that way. Or is it because we were obviously Americans? Well, Americans are screwing things up by tipping in Europe on American standards. In America, we do not pay our wait staff um, reasonable uh, income, so they have to rely on tipping. And it is a problem if you don't tip properly. In Europe, uh, waiters and waitresses get a, livable, a living wage, and tipping is not that big a deal. Uh, generally services included. If it says services included, that means services included. The Europeans, they say they, they, they leave the brown coins, you know, they leave the little coins or something. I rounded up a, a euro or two, but tipping is not a big deal in Europe. Americans are doing their best to screw that up by thinking it's doing everybody a big service by, by messing up a nice system by injecting our approach to tipping. I, I just don't think it's a big deal in Europe. Round it up. If you, feel, if you had good service, round it up. A lot of Europeans expect good service. They're, the service is included yeah. in many ways, and they just say, you've been paid, I'm out of here. Remember when you're assessing prices in restaurants, in the United States, you know, a, a hamburger will cost this, plus you got tax, plus you got service. In, in Europe, a hamburger will cost more, but it includes tax and it includes service. So it includes 25%, uh, and it costs 25% more. It's just a more straightforward way of pricing. That's that's really smart. I never really thought about it that way. Yeah, that's always the one where you're like, um, I don't know what to do. All right, here's a question I want to know the answer to. 
How often do you do laundry when you travel? I do laundry. I don't, I don't believe in washing pants and shirts all the time like you would at home. You know, you don't need to wash your shirt every day. You wear an undershirt and you wash your undershirt and your underwear and your socks. And um, if you're a rugged person, you can just do it in the sink in the hotel once a week. Um, uh, if you've got a little more money, you can take it to the laundromat or you can get it washed in the hotel with their service. It's quite expensive to have the hotel wash it, but it depends on my situation. A lot of times I'll have the hotel wash it. Uh, every once in a while, I got to get my pants and shirts uh, washed and I'll have that. The economic way is to take it in a bag. The hotel has this plastic laundry bag. Take it to the laundromat down the street. And I like to drop it off and let them do it and pick it up later. A lot of hotels have a laundromat service that picks up the uh, your laundry from the hotel, but uh, or you can do it yourself in a self-service laundromat. In the spirit of your time is valuable and I don't want to waste a lot of time sitting in a laundromat while I'm in Europe, I drop it off in the morning and I pick it up at the end of the day and that's how I get my laundry done. Uh, also, I look at washing in the sink as exercise. For me, it's, <laughs> it's just a nice workout and uh, I wring it really tight and I hang it in a low key way because, you know, hotels don't want to look like a, some kind of a, a laundromat, you know, but um, that's just me on the road. Uh, it's, yeah. it's not a big deal. Unless you have to have the standards you've got at home and you want everything freshly washed and fluffy all day long. Um, you know, it's, you're on the road. <laughs> that's a really good point. I mean, that's one of the things I like about cruise ships. Like I can pick one day to do some laundry, but you're right. The standards on the road are different. You're doing something different. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions coming in about what your thoughts are on the safety in Europe right now and traveling there. And in particular, I'm guessing to that part of Europe. Well, I mean, there's there's COVID, there's Ukraine, there's terrorism, and there's petty pickpocketing and purse snatching, and then there's violent crime. Um, you know, Ukraine is out of our control. Um, uh, it's as far from Munich in Germany to Kiev as it is from Miami to Guatemala City. So remember, there's in, in, in Guatemala and Central America. So it's not like next door. If there was a war going on in Guatemala, would you go to Miami? Sure, you would. If there's a war going on in Ukraine, would you go to Germany? Sure, logically. So you got to decide what's comfortable. Now, I'm not going to say, I mean, when you go on vacation, you don't want to have anxiety. If you can't handle it, stay home. It's okay. I'm telling, we got people canceling out of our tours. You know, we got 20,000 people signed up on our tours right now. Some people, they're not wired to take that stress of a war going on a couple countries away. I understand. Go back. Uh, here's your money back. Come back uh, next year. Um, but that's a choice you make. I'm going next week and I haven't given it a second thought. I mean, it's tragic and all that, but it's not going to stop me from traveling. And I, why would I penalize the people who need my business? I like to consume in a way that small businesses get my money. Um, so there's that. COVID, some people don't, aren't comfortable traveling in the COVID in the United States. You should not go to Europe. But if you're, tra if you're comfortable traveling in the United States, you should be comfortable traveling in Europe. That's what I would say. Uh, terrorism, it's just silly to worry about terrorism. You live in a country which has far more violent murders than any totally. country you can travel to because yeah. there's so many guns in our country. And it's just part of our Second Amendment rights that a lot of people get guns and we lose a lot of people every year. So, uh, you know, we, we lose a thousand people needlessly to handguns in our country every month. Right. So don't tell me about terrorism. Tell me about gun violence. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is petty purse snatching and pickpocketing. Uh, there's no muggings in Europe. You're not going to get a victim of violent crime. There's not going to be a drive-by gang shooting or something, and you're going to get unlucky. That doesn't happen in Europe. I mean, Germany loses 30 or 40 people a year to gun violence, where we lose 10 or 20,000 people. The real danger is petty purse snatching and pickpocketing because thieves in Europe target Americans, not because they're mean, but because they're smart. If I was a, a thief in Europe, I'd specialize in Americans. I'd have a little card that says Yanks are us. Um, because we're the people with all the purses, all the good stuff in our purses and wallets. Solve that by wearing a money belt, leaving your valuables in the hotel room, zipping it in, buttoning it down. Uh, don't going into neighborhoods that seem a little sketchy after dark. Uh, you know, common sense, uh, and you're fine. I always think about that when the bank robber was asked why they rob banks. It's like because that's where the money is. <laughs> yeah. Well, why do you rip off American tourists? Why do you grab American they have money? There's all sorts of stuff in that American tourist bag. A European wouldn't have all that cash in that bag. Right. They're like, we know where the cash is. 
Right. Okay, here's another great question. A couple of people have kind of asked this, but with for people with more mobility issues, right? Now you said you're in your mid 60s and you're out there traveling around and riding luges, but what about people with mobility issues? Any advice for them? You know, one thing I learned as I was hiking around Mount Blanc, being 66 years old, um, that was my limit, my physical limit. I had never done that before. I have never hiked for seven hours a day, six days in a row. You know, I, I can take one long hike, but can I, my body do that for seven days in a row? Have good gear, have poles. I'd be scared to death to do that without poles, but that's hiking in the mountains. But what I really became adamant about or religious about was stretching. And... Uh, we need to stretch. And I was, I made a point. I just said, I'm going to take this stretching thing seriously. And when you're in Europe or when you're on, I always talk about Europe, but it could be traveling anywhere, but Europe's my beat. You walk a lot. It's a great thing. You feel healthy, but you do get stiff after all of that exercise. And then you feel older than you are. You got to stretch, learn about stretching, practice stretching, make it a part of your daily routine and you'll feel younger. Um, that's just, to me, really important. Uh, don't worry about how your shoes look as, as much as how, how much support they give you. You need that. Uh, get in shape before your trip. Um, yeah, I just think, uh, you know, all of us have our limits. Some of us are, are beyond our hiking days. That's okay. You still should be a good walker. Um, also, remember, you can always get a ride. Use Uber. If you like Uber here, use it in Europe. It, it doesn't work in all countries because some countries have more protections for their taxi industry. But generally, Uber works the same in Europe with the same app that it does here. Um, I, I was so surprised. I was so excited. I'm like, I can Uber. It is an Uber. It's so easy. If you like Uber, it's great in Europe. In fact, bam, you got a ride and it's cheap. Well, we are coming up in the hour. We could talk to you for hours and hours, Rick. I love this. Thank you so much. Um, we want to sincerely thank you for joining us today, Rick, and everyone for coming and asking your questions. Hey, you know, yeah. Jack, I should mention, I have a party. Uh, we have a party every Monday night. It's called Monday Night Travel, and it's free. People just log on. We've done it all through COVID time. We've done it uh, for a couple of years now. And I did recently a one-hour special on that hike around Mount Blanc, which is oh, really nice. Fun. And you can learn all about it with my whole slideshow and so on. If you go to the our web, our, our ricksteves.com webpage, on the, on the front page, it says Monday Night Travel. And there's an archive of all 60 shows we've done. And oh, wow. I also did a one-hour special on COVID travel, talking more in depth about all this, the conditions I found in Europe just in the last couple of months. That's so there's great. a lot of good practical information there if people are curious. Awesome. So that's at ricksteves.com. And, and again, you can see that slide and where to follow and all that as well um, in the recording you're going to get. Um, and you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat and the QA. So thank you so much. And for everyone joining us, please come back and join us in May for our next webinar, which will be Fashion for Older Adults. We're going to do that on May 11th. Come back and join us. And each of our webinars features a different subject. You can go to brookdale.com slash in the know, see the full series, discover more, lots of great topics there. And we hope you'll check those out. We hope we'll see you again soon. And until next time, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. Happy travels. Thanks. Thank you.